Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share. It's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. Keep in mind everything that you need to know about photography. F-stop, shutter speed, lens selection. Nice photo, I've got beautiful light now. Oh my God. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. You know, for most people, nature photography consists of birds and large mammals, but it's the small creatures that live on the forest floor, along streams, and even under rocks that can truly give us some spectacular images. This week, we're gonna meet up with natural history photographer, Clay Bolt, and he's gonna share with us his techniques for using macro photography to reveal the hidden world. I'm Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. So today we're up in the mountains of South Carolina photographing a very unique landscape in something known as a cataract bog, which is only found in the mountains of South Carolina. In front of me here I have some mountain sweet pitcher plants, which is a, a very, very special plant. Because of the habitat and because of where this plant grows, I want to really be able to show the plant within its environment, but also get very close so that you can see the details. I'm using a special lens called a corrected fisheye lens, which is a very wide lens that allows you to get very close to your subject while not having a lot of distortion in the background like with a traditional fisheye lens. So the cool thing is I can pre-focus this. I'm using manual focus uh, because I'm so close to my subject. Autofocus doesn't really work too well. And I'm going to be able to get very close into my subject while still keeping it in focus. Now you can see that the light's starting to come in and it's a little bit contrasty. And the way to get around that is to use fill flash. So I have two flashes here and both of these flashes are going to be firing at about the same power um, and they're going to be triggered remotely using my pop-up flash. Now with Nikon, Nikon has something called the creative lighting system which allows you to control it using your pop-up flash. But if you're shooting Canon, not a problem. You can use pocket wizards or other remote trigger devices to trigger flashes remotely. And the first thing I'm going to do in a situation like this is actually come in and just get a read on the ambient light in the situation. That's the light that you find in a natural situation uh, for the sun. And I'm just going to come in, I'm going to move in slowly and see if I can see how the image looks. The flashes didn't fire and that's on purpose because I just want to get, as I said, a read on the light that we have in this situation. And I can see that while the rock is a little bit uh, dark, the sky is looking good and that's really what I want. I'm mainly concerned with the background so far because remember we have these flashes that are going to fill in those details. So I might make a quick adjustment to set the uh, exposure for the background and see what this looks like. That looks pretty good. I can see the water now is, is in focus. Um, I can see the details in the trees, but they're not too hot. Now I'm going to turn on my flashes and see how that looks. So I'm going to move in slowly. And before I do that, I'm going to put my pop up so that I can trigger my flashes. Now I'm moving in. When it's in focus, this is looking pretty good, but what I'm going to do is actually just decrease the power of the flashes. Again, these are at the same setting mostly, for the most part, and uh, just turn that down. I'm at one fifth power on both of these flashes. I'm going to turn down to one 6.4 and just see how that looks. Really what I'm trying to do is mimic the natural light with my flashes. 
The key to really using flash well is to blend it into the scene in such a way that you don't really get um, the impression that flash was even used at all. Now you can notice that I've got these mini soft boxes on the flash. And the point of that is to actually diffuse the light so that you don't have hot spots on your subject. Um, if you just use a flash without a soft box, you're gonna have some bright highlights. So I am at an F16 and I'm around uh, 1 60th of a second. Now because I'm using flash, it helps to freeze the motion so I actually don't have to have my camera on a tripod. Now a lot of times you may hear people suggest that when you're photographing plants that you should do that on a brightly lit overcast day, which is an excellent uh, bit of advice. But with wide angle macro photography, one of the great things about it is you can actually shoot in the middle of the day when the sky is nice and blue and the light's very bright. And the reason you can do that is because, again, fill flash helps to fill in the contrasty shadows. But the great thing about shooting on a blue sky day is it gives you an Alice in Wonderland effect because you're very close to your subjects there's something very surreal about the way that looks. And so, you know, you can shoot all day long with this technique. Hey, Doug, there's some really cool stuff over here if you want to come take a look. Awesome, I'll get over there in just a minute. I'm gonna finish up this shoot. I caught something really great for our field studio technique that we're gonna do later on. What you got? Yeah, this is a really cool bee. And uh, I'm going to transfer it into a container so we can shoot it in a little bit. But let's just see if we can do this without it escaping. Well, you here. know why I call those bees. Why is that? Because I let them be. <laughs> oh, but they're so adorable. Okay. I think you've done this once or twice. Just a few, few times. Very so cool. now you can see it in here. And yeah, this is a leaf cutter bee and uh, really beautiful. We're going to really see the detail in this when we photograph it in a few minutes in the studio. Awesome. What we're going to do is photograph this in something called the Meet Your Neighbors Field Studio. Basically, we put the subject on the white background, illuminate it with two flashes, and you get to see this incredible amount of detail. It's a totally different way to see wildlife, and it's a great tool for education and for conservation. So, and we really want to try to minimize the time that the subject's captive, and we just release it after we photograph it as soon as possible. So what I usually do is I start out with a, with a small object. This is just a little twig that, that I found that is about the same size as the bee, and I can use that as my test subject. Mm -hmm. So that once I introduce it into the set, it's gonna be, everything's gotcha. gonna be ready to go. Sense. So the first thing I do is I'm gonna turn on my flash. I have a flash beneath the table here, uh, just an off-camera flash, and I'm gonna test that out. Um, starting out, I'm gonna be at shutter speed of 125 at f16, and I'm using, by the way, I'm using a 55 millimeter macro lens. This is a very old Nikon lens with a 27.5 extension tube. Wow, okay. Yeah, so that so allows- really getting close. Get really, really close, but still have a maximum amount, amount of detail. So I've got my flash on beneath, and I've set that flash at about one-fifth power. That's a good starting point. Get in here. And now this is just a piece of uh, frosted Lexan. Yeah, it's called Acrylite, actually. The number of this is 2447 if you ever have, ever have to order it. And it looks like you just got a PVC pipe that you constructed this table. I guess light so you can pack it in and pack it out. Yeah, it's great for backpacking. That's exactly why I, why I built this. And one of the things you want to do when you're testing it out, the goal is to have the flash beneath bright enough that it completely blows out any detail in the background. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you can do is actually turn your um, blinking highlights on on your camera right so that when that exposure is perfect the background is going to be blinking got you and you know that you have no detail at that point so let's turn this up a little bit i am at iso 400 because we're in the shade i'm going to try to boost it up to iso 500 and mm -hmm. see what we what we've got here now that you've got that then we're going to turn on our fill flash and this is just going to fill in the shadows uh, and give you a little bit more pop on your subject. So I'm going to turn that slightly to a slightly less power than the, the flash beneath. So we'll be at like one 6.4 power. And these are both on different groups so that I can control them separately. Right. Yeah, this is a very unique way of, of shooting things. Um, other photographers that I've had co-hosts the show with, like Kevin Adams, you know, he brings in you know, lots of reflectors and stands and everything just to, to photograph, you know, one particular flower. And, you know, that's what people, you know, don't understand. It, creating a, a real photograph that has interest and impact 
it's not a, it's the farthest thing from a snapshot <laughs> as you can get because it takes time for one shot. You Absolutely, know? yeah, you're really making a photograph instead of taking a photograph. Right. Okay, so now that we've got our exposure set, I'm gonna transfer the bee into this little container here and see if we can get a shot of it. Okay. Let's hope we don't lose him. Yeah, it's always fun. This is the scary part. This guy's pretty calm right now, so I'm feeling, feeling pretty hopeful. There you go. Most people see a bee and they think, oh, it's just a They're bee, all right? Bee. They're all the same. Mm -hmm. But what's special about this bee is that it actually collects pollen beneath its abdomen, unlike a lot of bees that collect pollen primarily on their legs. Mm -hmm. So this is a leaf cutter bee, and they use their big mandibles to cut off sections of leaves to line their nest. Wow. And this is something you don't see if you just see this bee flying around in the field, but this technique really highlights those special features that make it identifiable. Um, so what I'm going to do is just move in kind of close. Now, we're very fortunate. This bee is very calm. It's early in the day. And I'm just manually focusing and using really this background as almost like a focusing rail. And when I see its eyes in focus, I'm just going to fire that. And then we got a little movement there. Got his wings up. Yeah, and I'm going to shoot it from the side this time because you can see those hairs on his abdomen really spread out. So you're not even removing the cup completely. You're just... Right. And you're letting the light blow out the plastic of the cup. Yeah, this little cup is actually just a sandwich meat container, you know, and, and I'm all about DIY stuff, so right. everything here in the set is just easy to get. Um, and I'm just lifting this up. This is the best way i found to photograph bees. And I'll tell you, a lot of people, when they, they photograph insects, you'll hear people asking, well, do you cool your subjects right. in a fridge or, or use uh, slightly gas them a little bit? And I never do that because, you know, it's the well-being of the subject really Absolutely. comes first. And the other thing I'll tell you is that, you know, people think they can cheat with this kind of photography, but you can really tell when an animal has been um, controlled in that way. Yeah, I really especially with snakes. I see uh, snakes with um, blood coming around their, around their mouth where oh, people yeah. handle them so much and, yeah. you know, just really harass them. I can't tell you the number of photographs that I have passed up because, you know, it would in order to get the shot, it would have required really some... Uh, invasive wrangling, I guess you should say. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And this is a female bee, I can tell because of the way the hairs are in her abdomen. And you know, somebody will say, well, this is just an insect. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it matter? But she has a nest that she's caring for. She has young. And so we have to take that into consideration as wildlife photographers. It's so important to try to be as ethical as possible right. and do the right thing. So I'm going to just shoot her a couple more times, and I think she's going to be ready re to be released back in the field. Well, this is a, a neat photograph just simply because it's you know it can be used even for for more uses more of a naturalistic way of, of shooting things to for documentary purposes mm -hmm. um, because you're seeing a lot more detail than to say if i shot that this the same bee on a leaf right. you know we're seeing so much more detail and a lot of times especially with with small insects like this that um the slightest little variation can mean the difference between one species and absolutely. another, but to the naked eye, it, you know, it looks exactly You're the same. You're absolutely right. So uh, this is a very cool way. I know when I did some work in South America, um, we built studios like this in the jungle, but they were all natural studios. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we, we just you know, kind of strategically placed uh, the, the right leaf and the right kind of mm -hmm. thing just to make it you know, yeah. uh, visually appealing. But uh, this is almost the same thing, but you know, taking it to a different level. Yeah, and this works great not just with insects, but also with plants, with rocks. I mean, anything you can think of can be photographed in this manner, from large reptiles to, to what, whatever you want. And the great thing is, if you're in a habitat like this, where there's a lot of dense clusters of vegetation and things, mm -hmm. this is a way to complement that other type of right. natural history photography and really show those small specimens for, for the beautiful creatures that they are. Absolutely. So get one shot, and I think I made quite a quick little adjustment, and I think we're ready to let this one go. Oh yeah, this is turning out really good. What I've got here is some more of the very specific 
mountain sweet pitcher plants and they're in an ocean of uh, yellow coreopsis blooms. This has turned out really nice. I almost walked right past this because as you're walking down the trail, it just looks like a bunch of clutter of weeds and, and flowers. And so we've only got four pitcher plants right here in front of us, but they're sitting right down into these yellow blooms. You have to kind of work yourself around and find a vantage point that, uh, that you can see your subject clearly, but you don't want to go in here and move a lot of vegetation around. You want to try to shoot it the way it is. So I'm using a 180 macro lens. And what that's allowing me to do is just isolate these three little uh, pitcher plants and I'm using all the clutter around it to blur and it's gonna kind of frame my subject. Remember when you're dealing with a macro lens, your depth of field is really, really shallow. So you've got to use an f-stop that is gonna give you the maximum amount of uh, depth of field with the given light that you're shooting in. Now I'm in very low light right now, it's early morning. And so I'm only shooting at f11. Um, I'm shooting at a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second because I do have a little bit of wind blowing it around occasionally um, and I'm at an ISO of 1250. So this is giving me a really nice shot. I'm, I've added a fill flash just to kind of punch the colors a little bit and fill in some of the shadow areas. And I've just dialed my flash down minus one third of a stop and it's giving me a really nice effect. One thing to keep in mind when you're working around endangered species like this, don't come into this area and start trampling all over the place. You've got to watch where you place every footstep because you could be destroying the uh, last few remaining plants that, that we have. And these uh, mountain sweet pitcher plants, they're very specific only to a couple areas in the mountains of North and South Carolina. So this has been a real treat. Let's see what else we can find. When you're working with salamanders, you can't photograph them where you find them because we found them under a dirty, muddy old rock and, and it was just impossible to really photograph them under there. So we've only moved them a few feet from where, where we actually captured them. And we're gonna try to attempt to put them on this pretty moss covered rock right here, which is the same environment that they live in and get a couple shots. Things you have to keep in mind, salamanders wet and we've got light, especially flash hitting it, and it's gonna create shine. Just like the water on the rock up at the bog this morning, um, we, we control that shine on the water with a pol circular polarizer filter. So what I did is I took a wet leaf and laid it right here where I'm gonna place the salamander and adjusted my circular polarizer until the shine on the leaf went away and then just removed the leaf. Other things to consider is on the flash setting. So I went ahead and set my ambient light for the, for the exposure of the camera for the scene. Now I'm adding a flash and I don't want it to look like a flash shot. If you do flash properly, you can't even really tell that it was illuminated with a flash. So the flash is just to kind of fill in dark areas and, and saturate your colors a little bit. So I'm actually dialing down my flash exposure minus one stop. Um, and that should give me a nice soft effect. I've also got the diffuser lid pulled down the front of my flash to kind of diffuse some, some of that light and make it a little more, little softer. This is the kind of thing, it just takes patience. It does. Yeah, when you're working with a, a wild animal, you just, you have to be ready for unexpected surprises. All right, hold on. Even salamanders. And you will need to move that cup out the way. Yeah. Okay. You tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. Just let it settle down. Yeah. It's not an ideal pose, but we'll see what you get. I'm gonna try to move around the other side of him. Okay. Hopefully he'll stay. Clay, you may have to move a little bit to your left so you're not in the shot. Got it. He's cooperating pretty well right now. 
Really nice. Okay, once you get him back in the water, these, these guys dry out very quickly and we never want to jeopardize an animal's safety for the sake of a picture. There we go. Yeah, it's very careful not to handle these too much because they absorb things through their skin. So it looks like he's happy. Hey, cool, what did you find? Uh, we got a Eastern Newt here. Oh, that's, that's called the F stage. And what that means is for a couple of years after they emerge out of the water, they wander through the forest. And you can see they've got this really bright coloration. And the reason they have that is because they're actually toxic. Really? Yeah, so no predator is gonna to wanna to mess with this guy. So unlike a lot of salamanders that you see, it's just gonna walk through the forest very calmly. And after it does this for a couple of years, the, the neatest thing is it goes to back to the water and usually they'll stay there for the rest of their life. That's very cool. Yeah. I, I know in the Amazon, you know, all the brightly colored frogs and stuff, those are the ones that were toxic absolutely, as well. So yeah. this is, I mean, and on this boss, this is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's I a striking you. contrast for sure. Yeah, let me get a few more shots here. All right, that's great. I, okay, I'm gonna head back down the trail and see if I can find anything else to photograph. Good deal, all right, good see deal. You in a bit. All right. I'll tell you, it looks like this Little Newt is just screaming. There's so much color here. The orange of the skin and, and then the green of the moss, it's making for a really spectacular shot. You know, it's really interesting that even though a Newt technically is you know, a salamander, his skin is much different than the salamanders we were handling earlier because the Newt has dry skin, whereas the salamanders have wet skin and they actually breathe through their skin. So because I'm not having to worry about shine from the water of the wet skin on this guy, I can, I've taken the uh, circular polarizer off. I don't have anything else in the scene here that is creating any glare or shine. So I completely did away with the uh, circular polarizer. Now, my settings for this are 1 60th of a second at uh, aperture of f11 and we are very dark it's getting to be the, the end of the day and we're in the forest and so my iso i'm having to shoot at uh, 2500 got my flash setting at uh, minus two so um, i've taken away two stops of light and this is really working out nicely i've got my diffusion on front of my flash here so uh shooting a 180 millimeter macro lens and this is really making for a great shot here the depth of field is so shallow that you know only a few millimeters and the subject is completely out of focus so using high f-stop f11 is getting trying to get as much um, depth of field as i can and waiting for trying to keep him perpendicular to the digital sensor in the camera so this is working out really well all right i'm gonna let this guy move on about his business and uh, we're gonna try to see what else this day can uh, produce for us So unlike this morning where we wanted to see the background behind our subject and show the environment that, that they live in, this is a much different scenario. We've got a beautiful lunar moth caterpillar here on a mountain laurel twig and we've got mottled light all around and the sun's in and out so we've got big patches of, of bright spots all around throughout the forest so we don't want to show that. And in a scenario like this, Clay's going to show us his technique for how to shoot using multiple flashes to blacken out the background and just really focus on this guy. Right. Take us through how you go about doing this. Yeah, so the first thing I wanna do is again, I don't want any light to show up in the background. I, I want it to be completely dark. So I've set my camera at uh, F16 at 1 200th of a second. And I'm just gonna see where we're at. And my ISO is uh, at 640, cause it is a little dark in here even still. With just your ambient light. Exactly, just the natural light that's coming in. So we'll see where we're at. All right, so right there you can see it's yeah. completely dark, mm -hmm. no detail. Now we're gonna start adding light into the scene. So Doug, if I can get you to hold this flash okay. up about right here, and we've got this mini softbox on here because I really wanna spread the light all across the subject here. Okay. So let's see how this looks. That looks pretty great. 
Yeah, you can yeah. see the subjects illuminated. And let's see where we're at on our flash setting. I'm at, I'm at one fifth power. Okay. So that's pretty good. And the soft box is doing a good job of spreading the light out. And this is the secret. I'm going to turn on the second light. Now this is the rim light, and this is going to give that extra pop. One flash is great, but two or three do even more for your image. And what this is actually going to do, we've got this little diffusion dome cap on the flash. This is going to come in and highlight these little hairs and uh -huh. just give it that extra... Show some, all that little detail. In absolutely. Your, yeah. And I've set this at uh, 6.4 on power, but you can even go higher if you need to. Okay. All right, Doug, let me get you to hold okay. that flash up for me. Yeah. Fantastic. Now you can really see those details. Oh, wow, yeah. A hair light, just like in a studio. Absolutely. We're, yeah. we're giving this the, the celebrity treatment. <laughs> That's really spectacular. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, let's get this guy back to where we found him and uh, let him go on about his way because he's been super cooperative. He has. And uh, see what else we can find. Fantastic. All cool. right. You know, it really is amazing what you can find when you just slow down, take the time, and really look. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, that's really what I'm passionate about. I really want people to realize that you don't have to travel to a faraway place to see something extraordinary. And I really believe that that's the future of conservation, especially with kids. If we can get kids connected to the wildlife that lives right there where they live, then we really have some hope for the future. Now, you've got a project going on now, right, with uh, National Geographic? Well, this is an international nature photography project called Meet Your Neighbors, okay. and our fa focus is to help photographers all around the world connect their local communities with the wildlife that lives where they live. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. I tell you what, you've really put us on some awesome stuff so far. I'm, I'm anxious to see what else we find. Absolutely. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this week's show and learned a little more about macro photography and photographing the small creatures of the unseen world. More information about this show or Clay Bolt's work is available online. And remember, it's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, for Wild Photo Adventures. I'm babbling. Let's <coughs> start over. I've got a wide angle lens getting in close, and I've got my camera. I'm babbling. <clears throat> All right, Clay, let's cover him up and get him back in from water. We don't want him to dry out. Great idea. So I'm going to do a shot and just, I don't really want to see anything in focus in the, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to start. Right. The unseen creatures, uh, the creatures of unseen, that's all you want to say? Yeah. Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share.